Well, good morning and welcome to our morning service today at St Margaret's. A particular welcome to any who might be tuning in for the first time and a, of course a very warm welcome to all of our regulars. The theme of our service today is the supremacy of Christ and uh, we're going to be looking at the second in our series at the first chapter from the book of Colossians. And to uh, set our minds right, we're going to sing that wonderful hymn, All My Days, I Will Sing a Song of Gladness, which reminds us that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the star of the morning, and heaven's champion, All My Days. sing this song of gladness give my praise 
to the fountain of delight For in my helplessness you heard my cry And waves of mercy poured down on my life I will trust in the cross of my Redeemer I will sing of the blood that never fails Of sins forgiven, of conscience cleansed Of death defeated and life without end Beautiful Savior, wonderful Counselor, Lord in majesty, Lord of history, you're the way, the truth, the life, star of the morning, glorious in holiness, you're the risen one, heaven's champion, and you reign, you reign. I long to be where the praise is never ending Yearn to dwell where the glory never fades Where countless worshippers will share one song and cries of worthy will honor the Lamb. Beautiful Savior, wonderful Counselor, clothed in majesty, Lord of history, you're the way, the truth, the life, star of the morning, glorious in holiness. You're the risen one, heaven's champion, and you reign, you reign over all. Thank you, Ben. Well, we're going to turn to our confession now, but as we do so, it's good just to be reminded of those words that we've just sung. I will trust in the cross of my Redeemer. I will sing of the blood that never fails. So when we come to God to confess our sins, it's not that he might forgive us. We can rest in the assurance that he will. Just a moment of quiet now, just to call to mind any areas of your life where you have felt that you have grieved the Lord this past week. So together we say, O King enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name. Lord God Almighty, in our sinfulness we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the passage that we're looking at today, we will read these words. Jesus has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death to present us holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Isn't that a wonderful truth? And so in view of that, may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Before we come to our reading, we're going to sing another wonderful song that just reminds us something of our salvation. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb.
Thank you ever so much, Tina and Brian. Well, we're going to come to our reading and talk now, and the reading is taken from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And if you've got a Bible anything like mine, it's on page 1182. Let me read it to you. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Then as we come to think about those words, let's just pause to pray. Father in heaven, as we come now just to look at the supremacy of Christ, all that he is, all that he has done, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you give us eyes to see and understand. Well, today I want to look at the supremacy of Jesus, and I want to look at what we mean by that. And it's his uniqueness and the necessity of that u- uniqueness. In this passage, we read that Jesus is creator. And so from that, we understand that Jesus is to be the center of all things, both in creation and the church. Jesus is to be the focus of our worship, the foundation of our trust, and the motivation for every action. Now, Paul had never been to Colossae, but he writes this letter to them. He's aware of the fact that it's a young church, and reports have reached him that there's been a certain amount of false teaching in the church. But no doubt people had been to hear him. So, for example, when he was ministering at Ephesus, there was a lecture hall Uh, the lecture hall of Tyrannus that was uh, made available to him. And we're told in Acts of the Apostles that people from all around the area came to hear Paul. Wouldn't you have liked to have just had some opportunity to listen to Paul at one of those lectures, albeit in English rather than ancient Greek? But the trouble was the Colossians uh, risked losing sight of how special Jesus was. And this is something that's very relevant for us, as I'll explain shortly. Many years ago, when I was a youngster living in Winchmore Hill in um, North London, I went to um, the local church, St. Paul's, and it was a very high church. And the vicar there asked me to learn to be a server, uh, which meant at Holy Communion, I used to wash his hands. I used to wear garments. At various times, I had to cross myself. In fact, I was so preoccupied with some of the regulations that uh, one had to follow or rituals that one had to follow that I lost all sight of what the service was about. And sometimes uh, we can get things like rituals 
observances, the way we do things, and this is something that comes up in chapter 2 in Colossians, uh, take our sight from just how special Jesus is. And as I said, it's something very relevant for us because in the UK, it would be difficult to say that Jesus is at the centre of government, industry, leisure, media, all these things, is it? And it's very dangerous when a country seeks to uh, make progress and move ahead, but ignore Jesus in doing that. And it would be difficult to say that in our country, Jesus is the focus of our worship. Uh, difficult to say that he's the anchor of our hope. Our country and things like vaccines are very important things, uh, certainly. But uh, we tend to put our trust in vaccines, money, experts, and so often. As a nation, our trust should be in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Colossians risk losing sight of how special Jesus was, and that would affect and feed into the rest of their church life. Just as if we lose sight of Jesus and get preoccupied with the good, which uh, is not the best, or even things less than good, then that will feed into our lives both as a church and uh, as a country. Now, there are three questions that I just want to look at today, three very simple questions. In what way is Jesus special? Why does he need to be special? And what is the relevance to you and to me? So just thinking about those three questions, uh, Jesus alone is sufficient. And that's what we're going to be looking at in a moment when we think of in what way Jesus is special. And why does he need to be special? Well, our need is great, isn't it? Uh, the needs in our country are just massive. And as we look at the problems our country is grappling with at the moment, they seem to transcend any uh, possibility of human strength meeting their need. How important it is that we look to the supremacy of Jesus. And thinking of relevance, well, it's Jesus who gives shape to our lives. So let's uh, think of uh, the ways in which Jesus is special. And in verse 15, it speaks of Jesus being the image of the invisible God. Now, this is saying something quite remarkable. It's saying that in that man who walked around Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea 2,000 years ago, the glory of the invisible God was made visible. In fact, that man who walked around 2,000 years ago had in himself the fullness of Almighty God. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus once said, when the disciples said, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied, Jesus said, well, if you just look at me, you'll see the Father. So we don't need to look beyond Jesus. We don't need to look away from Jesus. Simply looking at Jesus is what we need to do to understand the fullness of Almighty God. And the Colossians were losing sight of that. And that's why Jesus stresses, you don't need to look at angels or worry about rituals or any ascetic practice. We need to keep in mind Jesus. And then we're told, also in verse 15, that he's the firstborn over creation. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, Jesus was the first created being or anything like that when it says firstborn. That was a heresy that developed in the early church known as Arianism. In fact, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have adopted that particular heresy. Now, it means firstborn in the sense of the heir. Jesus is the primary heir of all things. He is the first in preeminence, and he's the one to whom everything will come under. He's the firstborn over creation. And we're told also that he's pivotal, pivotal in creation. So um, in verse 16, we're told all things have been created through him and for him. So through Jesus, all things were created and for Jesus, all things were created. And so that gives him a unique qualification to be our saviour. Many people will claim to uh, be able to help and 
do things and make a difference. But here we're talking about someone uh, through whom everything that was made was, was the agent of creation. And it was all made uh, for him. And so that gives him unique qualification to be our saviour. And then in verse 19, we're told that all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. There's an extravagance of language here, isn't there? Paul is using every word in his vocabulary to express something of the majesty and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how we need to be able to do that also. You see, when we look at Jesus, we're not looking at one third God with the Holy Spirit over there and the Father over there. We're actually looking at 100% of God. That's a part of the mystery of the Trinity. We don't look at uh, uh, some subsection of God, but of God in all his fullness. And uh, Jesus representing the full glory of the invisible God. Jesus is amazingly special. But why does Jesus need to be special? Well, in verse 17, we're told that in him, all things hold together. And that's an enormously important phrase for the present, because this isn't just a sort of once in time event telling us that in Jesus, all things hold together. It's a continuing truth. And what it means by that is that Jesus is the sustainer of creation. That moment by moment, Jesus is involved in creation. He's at the right-hand side of the Father. Through the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit, he hears our, spra- our prayers. In the spiritual battle that we're all part of and it seems to be raging at the moment, Jesus is the Lord on high. Jesus is the sustainer of the universe. And what that means for you and for me, that in our day-to-day struggles, it's not that Jesus takes away the struggle, but he's there with us, leading us through them, helping us. And just when we think we're at the end of our resources or strength, Jesus uh, leads us forward. Sometimes you may be uh, feeling very low, and that phone call comes in. You see, Jesus is with us. He leads us. He encourages us. He motivates us. But then we also notice that Jesus is head of the church. That's uh, verse 18. So when we think of Jesus and his involvement in creation, that most especially relates to the church. How important it is that we pray for the church. Do pray daily for St. Margaret's. Do pray daily for the leadership of St. Margaret's Church. Jesus is head of the church. And then next, we're told that Jesus is reconciler. Verse 21 is quite shocking, isn't it? Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. And uh, you may say, well, that doesn't apply to me, but the truth is, It certainly does. You see, this is telling us that uh, we weren't born into a state of grace. When we're born, we find ourselves in a state of alienation. Once we're enemies, uh, we, uh, according to the grace of God, come to Christ and to be reconciled to him. But it's Jesus who does the reconciling. When we come to Christ, it's not us that initiates that reconciliation. It's Jesus who offers us reconciliation and we receive it. And without that reconciliation, we remain alienated, as it tells us in verse 1. So why does Jesus need to be special? Because he needs to be reconciler. Why does Jesus need to be special? Well, because without a saviour, we're lost. We have no hope. And it's only Jesus who can be the reconciler. And so in verse 18, it tells us that Jesus makes peace by the cross. You see, if Jesus is the one who reconciles us, the means of that reconciliation is Jesus taking upon himself the penalty for my sins and your sins 
on the cross. It should have been Robert Lovett on that cross. But Jesus stands in my place that I might be forgiven. So even if I or anyone else would try, would try to uh, bring reconciliation between another person and God, it would be invalid because I'm not qualified to do it. Only Jesus can do that. And then he presents us without blemish. Sometimes we can make a real effort, can't we, to follow God's way, and then it all falls apart and we have to confess our sins. I remember in my years of teaching maths, I often used to think that the capacity to learn of some of the pupils I was teaching was like a sieve. You would teach them and it would all sort of disappear. And you'd come back to the next lesson and wonder, had anything from the previous lesson stuck? Well, you see, it's a bit like that with my righteousness. Whatever effort I make with my righteousness, it disappears very quickly. But Jesus, you see, as far as God is concerned, is able to present us without blemish, free from accusation and holy. Isn't that amazing? And let me come now towards the conclusion and think, what is the relevance to you and to me? Will you see Jesus as the Lord of creation, as the sustainer and the head of the church, as the one who's got a plan for your life and for mine that includes salvation? He's the one who establishes the rules. He's the one who shows us the pattern of life. It's not well-known advisors, it's not the government and their law, though those things are important, but it's the Lord Jesus who gives shape and direction to our lives and who establishes the rules. Once when I was a school teacher, I found my name to give a substitute lesson. I looked to see what it was, and it was uh, year nine football. So uh, I love football, uh, but I'd never been a referee before. So I took these lads out, 22 of them, to play football on a pitch. I got the whistle, and because I didn't know how to referee, the match fell into chaos. And they were arguing, and I was trying to impose my discipline, and I got out the red card a few times, and the whole thing was a disaster. That's because the rules had not been apparent to those 22 young lads trying to play football. How we need the rules. But Jesus is there to save us when we fail and to provide direction for us. And Jesus is there to keep us, so that when we fall, he lifts us up. When we feel... Uh, dejected about our own level of Christian commitment, he restores us and gives us fresh impetus. And Jesus is there to save us by the cross, as we have been thinking. Shall we pray? Jesus, we want to say that we believe you're truly wonderful. But in an age where so many have stopped looking to you, we would want to say, Yes, you are the Lord, you are the Saviour, you are the agent of creation and the one for whom all things were created. So help us in our walk with you to look and see your sustaining power in our lives, your help, your love. And help us always to remember with gratitude your saving work that has brought us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus. Amen. We're now going to move to our intercessions. And the intercessions will come in three sections. Uh, and I shall say, Lord, in your mercy, and if you're at home, uh, say, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Some words from Psalm 33. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33 says, a king is not saved by his great army, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. We pray for our nation at a crucial and troubled time. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. We pray into a situation 
where faith in Jesus Christ has been pushed to the margins and often ignored altogether, where sin is often deemed lawful and where the observance of faith in Jesus is upheld only by a small minority. Gracious Father, you teach us that it is not the strength of our armies or war horses uh, that saves us, but by our trust and faith in you. So that we pray that as this pandemic challenges the might of man, there may be a fresh turning to God in this land. May those who once in their childhood heard the good news of Jesus return to the ancient paths and put their trust in him again. May those who made a profession of faith at a Billy Graham rally or perhaps a similar evangelistic event but have since backslidden, may they see their sin, the majesty of Jesus, and return. May those brought up in Christian families but who've wandered from the truth return to him who is the way, the truth, and the life. And maybe you can think of mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, nieces, who've wandered from the truth. Just mention their name to the Lord Almighty. In a world of social media confusion, fake news, conspiracy and deceit, may the simple truth of Jesus and him crucified stand out like a beacon of light in a lost world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for the example of Her Majesty the Queen, a public expression of faith. We pray for her Prime Minister, Mr Johnson. Grant him time to reflect on the spiritual foundation of his life. May his governance be according to the pattern of Christ. We think of other important ministers, Mr Rabb, the Foreign Secretary, Mr Sunak, the Chancellor, Mrs. Patel, Mrs. Hancock and Williamson. And we pray for them in their ministerial duties. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May we lift before Almighty God, the media and social media, something we rarely pray for. May we pray for such platforms as Sky, BBC, ITV, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube, and so on. We're concerned about the amount of violence, sex, misinformation, distortion that is often placed before us. We're concerned about the effects it has on our country. We pray for uh, teenagers beholden to mobile devices, and many of us as well. We're concerned about the agendas that sometimes lie behind the media. And so we pray for godly management, godly content, godly media personalities. We pray for truth, goodness, love and faith to prevail. And finally for St Margaret's. We thank you for our vicar Mark, for Ben our curate, for Matt our children's and families worker, and for Chris and Sarah in the office. And we pray that you help us as a church community in our mission and ministry. Christianity started, Christianity Explored started successfully last night, and we pray for Ben as he spearheads that. May we remember those who are sick and who have been bereaved recently. And so we think of Sheila and Julia, Fred and Paul. And we pray for any known to us suffering from coronavirus. A moment of quiet as you bring before God any you know. And finally, may we pray for wisdom for the PCC in their leadership of our church. Help them to discern the mind of God and help them to lead our church in a way that's going to uh, make the most of our mission and ministry in difficult circumstances. May God's grace be perfected 
in this time of limitation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Well, we've been thinking of the supremacy of the Lord Jesus today. And we're going to finish now with a, a wonderful hymn, one that's well known to us all. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Thank you so much, Graham, for that uh, great recording. Thank you for joining us today. And do join us this coming Sunday and then this time next week on Wednesday as we continue with our series on Colossians. Now the blessing. Jesus, who has reconciled us through his body on the cross to present us holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, may he bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.